This is Chapter 9, Inventory Costing and Capacity Analysis. This is Part 1, Inventory Costing. Okay, this is an interesting chapter. Um, we're really looking at what distinguishes a variable costing from absorption costing and why different methods are used in different situations. So we'll compute income under absorption costing and variable costing and explain the difference. Um, understand how absorption costing can provide undesirable incentives for managers to build up inventory. And this is probably one of the most important things that, that you all want to know as accountants. That, I mean, you've really got to be aware of what a manager is doing. They know those numbers a lot better than you do. And understanding it well is a way to increase income and even... Um, without anybody knowing, increased bonuses and things like that. So we'll distinguish throughput costing from variable and absorption costing. And then finally, we'll look at capacity. And then that is look at various capacity concepts that firms can use in absorption costing. Look at the key factors that managers choose <coughs> um, at capacity level to compute the budgeted fixed manufacturing uh, cost rate. Okay, this... These cost rates are, are difficult and fixed costs are high. Um, understand other issues that play an important role in capacity planning and control. All right, and even if you look at today, we have so much uncertainty in our markets, um, you can understand why these are sensitive issues. Now, our two major topics in this chapter are inventory costing and capacity le level issues. So this is just a brief overview. That for inventory costing, the two most common methods of costing inventory in manufacturing companies are variable costing and absorption costing. Okay, and when you see the word absorption, think of absorption as absorbing, that the inventory is absorbing overhead, in particular fixed overhead. Okay, the choice determines which manufacturing costs are treated as inventory and which ones end up being expensed on the income statement. That's the significant part. And then for capacity, uh, given a firm's level of spending on fixed manufacturing costs, what capacity level should managers and accountants use to compute the fixed manufacturing um, costs per unit produced? All right, what level? Because no one's ever at full level, and, you know, at each one of these things, as soon as you measure something, you impact someone's behavior. So how should it be done? Now these, there are three inventory costing choices. First, variable costing. That's a method of inventory costing, which one variable, just variable cost, I should probably stop with the purple, huh? Uh, direct and indirect are included as inventoryable costs. Okay, so if, if we attach cost to inventory, then it ends up on the balance sheet. That's the issue. Absorption costing is a method of inventory costing in which all variable and fixed, one more time, all variable and fixed manufacturing costs are included as inventoryable costs. You can say that inventory absorbs all manufacturing costs. Okay, and then throughput costing is the last one. This is a method of inventory costing in which only direct materials are included as inventoryable costs and everything else is expensed. Okay. Now we will experience a difference in income between absorption and variable costing due to the difference in accounting for fixed manufacturing uh, costs. Operating income will differ. The amount of the difference represents the amount of fixed manufacturing costs capitalized as inventory under absorption costing and then expensed is a period cost under variable costing. Okay, fixed manufacturing overhead is the issue. It's actually the issue in a lot of problems. Now here is, um, this exhibit highlights the difference between the two methods. This first panel, panel A, calculates operating income under variable costing, and panel B, under absorption costing. The variable costing format uses the contribution margin format introduced, um, well, in Chapter 3, which you haven't seen yet. Okay, we do that next. Uh, but this is, this is variable cost of goods sold 
So what we have here is um, we've got a contribution margin, and you you remember this from 2071, uh, where where these are all the variable costs on the top of the income statement, and then all the fixed costs are below. All right, so fixed manufacturing, fixed marketing costs, those are all there, and all the variable costs are up above. You know, so you get a true contribution margin. That's one of the reasons why we did it. Under absorption costing, it's organized according to um, cost uh, function. So these are inventory costs on the time on the top, and then operating costs down below. Under variable costing, it's organized by cost behavior. So we have um, variable costs up, to, up top, and then fixed costs down below. Okay. The distinction between variable costs and fixed costs is central to the variable costing um, issue, and it's highlighted in the contribution margin format. Okay, similarly, the distinction between manufacturing and non-manufacturing costs is central to absorption costing, and it's highlighted by the gross margin costs. These are all manufacturing costs, whereas these would be non-manufacturing costs. And note that the difference in operating income is 270000 Okay, the operating income under absorption costing is higher, which it will be when inventory is increasing. Um, and that is equal to 200 and what do we have? What's our unit? Our cost inventory is in there at $135 per unit. And we have 2,000 units in ending inventory, so that's our difference right there. Okay. Now, this is small. I know it's small. That's about the best we're going to get. You can follow this in your, in your textbook, though. Here we have two years of income statements under each system. Um, panel A, okay, up here. This is our variable cost up here on the top. And then absorption costing is down here in the bottom. Um, the values you see are still the same as in the previous slide. And there's a similarity between these two years. Okay, um, But note, in, let, let's take a look at 2018. The fixed cost rate of 135, here's our fixed cost rate of 135, is based on a budgeted capacity level of 8,000. In 2018, production was only 5,000, creating a production volume variance of 135 times 3,000, or $405,000. Under variable costing, fixed costs or expense is incurred and no production volume variance exists. So here are our fixed manufacturing costs coming out in full. Okay, operating income is higher ah, under variable costing here in 2018 because inventory decreased by 1500 units which means that the fixed costs for those units were expensed in 2018 under absorption costing and in 2017 under variable costing so under absorption those costs come flooding out into cost of goods sold okay so what are the real differences here the, the fact is that fixed manufacturing costs are deducted in full each year under variable costing. Okay, so for information purposes, this is this is really uh, probably a more useful way to do it. And it, when you think about variance analysis, what can you do about fixed manufacturing overhead? You know, really very little. So you want to get a, as good an idea about what's happening with your your direct costs and your variable costs as possible. Let's say more controllable costs. You know, not that the fixed overhead isn't worth working on, but it's just not the same. Now, this is not very clear, but these are comparative income effects of variable and absorption costing. Okay, um, so are the fixed manufacturing costs inventoriable? Under variable costing, they are not. Okay, but under absorption costing, it is. Okay, so the question is, when should be they be expensed? Is there production volume variance not under variable costing, but certainly under absorption costing? And the choice of the denominator, which we talk about in the next, next presentation, 
um, affects measurement of operating income under absorption costing only. Okay, um, are classifications between variable and fixed costs routinely made? Yes. All right, they are under variable costing and absorption costing. It pretty much stays the same. But the way something's classified, as you can see, has a has a really big impact. And how do changes of unit inventory level affect? Oh. When production equals sales, we've got no problems. Everything's the same. If production is greater than sales, variable costing will be lower than absorption costing because the fixed overhead cost per unit is moving onto the balance sheet. And variable costing, it'll still be in the income statement. When production is less than sales, variable costing will be higher and absorption costing will be lower. Okay? Um, because... Oh, why? Because you've got um, inventory that's, that's washing out, coming off the balance sheet under absorption costing and going into the income statement. Okay? And what are the effects on cost volume profit relationship for a given level of fixed costs and a given contribution margin uh, per unit? Uh, under variable costing, it's driven by the unit level of sales. Okay, under absorption costing, it's driven by unit level of sales, unit level of production, and chosen denominator level. So what this, you know, what it really means is that management has a lot more room to move under absorption costing. It gives them some wiggle room. If they need to change a number a little bit or move something from one period to the next, it's easier under absorption costing than it is under variable costing. So absorption costing is the required inventory method for external financial reporting in most countries. The other reason why um, companies prefer it is that it's cost effective, it's less confusing, but maybe it's only less confusing because no one's ever used the other method. You know, they're just used to this, but that counts for something. Um, it can help prevent managers from taking actions that make their performance look good. I'm not so sure about that. Um, in some ways, if you if you look at classifying something to, from fixed to variable, okay, you can move numbers back and forth there, um, not willy nilly, you know, but you can there's a little bit of wiggle room, put it that way, and it measures the cost of all manufacturing resources necessary to produce inventory. That's the theoretical argument there. And as we know, absorption costing is the required inventory method for external financial reporting in most countries. Additional information about the costing method is here. Um, an important attribute of, of absorption costing is that it enables a manager to increase margins and operating income just by producing more inventory. That doesn't seem to be a good thing to me. So if you produce a lot of inventory, you're decreasing the amount of fixed overhead per unit and that inventory is not going out on the income statement, it's going into the, onto the balance sheet. So producing for inventory is justified when a firm's managers anticipate rapid growth in demand and want to produce additional storage units to store for next year to deal with a possible production shortage in the future. Okay, that's the theoretical reason. Now, to reduce the undesirable effects of, un of absorption costing, managers can focus on careful budgeting and inventory planning. This is bugging me. Um, can incorporate an internal carrying charge for inventory. Now, that is an effective measure. If you put down a, a you know a point something percentage charge for carrying inventory, that will dissuade a manager from doing it. Okay, <clears throat> it wouldn't be something that they'd actually have to pay, but it would be part of their uh, financial report. It wouldn't show to the public. It would only be something internally. Or you could change or lengthen the period used to evaluate performance. Okay, that's one of our biggest problems is having too short a time horizon. We should be looking at things over maybe five years. That would change everybody's perspective. And include non-financial as well as financial variables in the measures to evaluate performance. 
Okay, compare with the ratio of beginning and ending inventory to the ratio of units produced or sold. Okay, non-financial performance measures are very, very important. Difficult to capture, but still important. And now we've got a, um, this throughput costing, and, and it's this is called super variable costing. Um, and what it does is it only direct material costs are included as inventory costs, okay, or are you know, put on the balance sheet. All other product costs are treated as period expenses and expensed because some managers believe that even variable costing promotes an excessive amount of costs being inventory. Now, the throughput margin is revenue minus all direct material costs of goods sold. Okay, now here's an illustration of throughput costing, and it looks so complicated, but it really isn't. We've got revenues, and then here's our direct material. There's direct material cost of goods sold coming out, and now instead of a, a gross margin or a contribution margin, we've got a throughput margin. Then other manufacturing costs, marketing costs, operating income. Okay, so only direct materials are subtracted from revenues to calculate the throughput margin. In this uh, slide, we've got a comparison of variable and absorption costing as would be calculated under the actual costing, normal costing, or standard costing systems. So as a result, we've actually got um, six alternative inventory costing systems. Who knew, right? So accountants and others disagree about which costs should be expense and which ones should be inventoried. For external reporting, shareholders, companies, uh, for external reporting to shareholders, companies around the globe tend to follow GAAP, and all manufacturing costs are inventoriable. Okay. So you can review this by yourself, but it's a good summary. So, and there's there's variable costing right here. Uh, throughput costing would just be just the one, you know, just the variable cost, but absorption costing is the whole thing. So we've concluded the discussion of inventory costing. We really need to do some problems here so you can see how it works. Um, so let's move on to the second part of the chapter on capacity analysis. And given a firm's level of spending on fixed manufacturing costs, what capacity level should managers and accountants use to compute the fixed manufacturing overhead uh, per unit? Okay, recall from an earlier slide that the key question regarding capacity concepts is given a firm's level of spending on fixed manufacturing costs, what capacity level should managers and accountants use to compute the fixed manufacturing costs per unit? Okay.